Well, a very good morning to those of us joining, those of you joining us stateside, and a good afternoon to those across the pond um, and around the world. Um, it is really a pleasure to share the next hour with you. Uh, my name is Noreen Chowdhury Fink. I'm the executive director of the Sufan Center. Um, and before we get started today, I would first just really like to uh, express my appreciation for the Erie Neve Trust, which has been a stalwart supporter of this project um, that we're going to be talking about, and also the project that preceded it, which, which laid the groundwork. So I'm immensely grateful to the Trust and delighted that, Hugh, you could be with us today um, and give us a few words of insight into the Trust and the background. Um, but before we move on, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about why we're here today and why we're having this webinar. We are immensely pleased to be launching four papers this morning. These are going to be four Sufan Center issue briefs. They will be going live shortly after this webinar, so watch that space. Um, and these four papers are the outcome of a project we've been conducting for a number of months to better understand the impact and when I say impacts, we mean financial, operational, legal, political, of sanctions, designations, proscriptions, and their application to addressing the far right, terrorism, and violent extremist threat. Um, we believed very strongly that you know, we have gathered some very important lessons learned over the last two decades. Uh, we know there has been a international sanctions regime looking at ISIS and Al Qaeda through the UN's 1267 uh, platform. We know that states have taken national measures, certainly. And so we wanted to better understand particularly those states which have already taken measures in designating far right groups as terrorists. And here we were looking particularly at the Five Eyes countries in large part and, and allies what kind of impacts these have had to date and would such sort of such uh, outcomes be useful on a transnational scale um, at the sufan center for a number of years now we have been talking about the transnational dimensions of the white supremacist extremism threat and the violent far-right movement and so the question came to us after diagnosing the problem and identifying it and, and making the case for it in fact to be a counterterrorism challenge that we should be thinking about. What then are the solutions we should be thinking about? A lot of us have been talking about the problem and hearing about the problem, and we thought it was high time we start looking at some concrete solutions, and if, how, where, why they might work. Um, we know there are transnational aspects of violent far-right groups. Is a transnational sanctions regime even on the cards for a threat like this? Would something like 1267 have any application to this kind of threat? Is there more we can learn from national measures? And for those of you who follow the UN world closely and the workings of the Security Council, a question to think about, is there another way we could think of a sanctions regime or a call for states through the Council to develop sanctions measures in their own national context. We can get into the, into the weeds of policy and practice uh, throughout these discussions, um, but we really thought it was important once we've all started understanding the problem to start thinking about solutions and ways forward and what kind of instruments we have in the counterterrorism toolkit as the terrorist threat diversifies. So with that said, I would like to turn over the screen to Hugh, again, with my thanks and appreciation to the Trust, to tell us a little bit about the Erie Neve Trust. Good morning to those of you in the United States, and welcome to this webinar on behalf of the Erie Neve Trust. The Trust was formed in Erie's memory in 1979, following his assassination by Irish terrorists. Uh, he was a soldier a hero, war hero, an author, and a politician. He was the first British officer to escape from Colditz Castle, a prison that the Germans claimed to be entirely escape-proof. After his return to England via Switzerland, southern, Africa, southern France and Spain, he joined MI9, a unit working to rescue Allied forces stranded behind enemy lines in Europe. After the end of the war, Airy played a significant role at the Nuremberg trials. He handed down the 23 indictments to all the defendants, uh, 
and was charged with finding them legal counsel. After the war, Airy became a conservative member of parliament. He read several books about his wartime experiences. In 1975, he ran Margaret Thatcher's campaign to take over the leadership in opposition of the Conservative Party. As a result of this success, he was offered any cabinet post that he wished in the future Conservative government. To the surprise of many, he chose the Northern Ireland portfolio, an area that he had covered in opposition. Airy held a strong belief that the UK should reinstate the death penalty for acts of terrorism. It was for this reason that the Irish National Liberation Army placed a balance bomb in his car, which exploded on the afternoon uh, in the, as he exited the House of Commons car park on the afternoon of March 30th, 1979. In May 1979, the, uh, the uh, involvement in cabinet. The objectives of the Area New Trust are to give financial support for writings, lectures, and seminars dealing with counterterrorism and extremism. Among my fellow trustees, a Lord, the German Lord of Athnot, who as a member of the House of Commons, was chairman of the House of Commons Defence Committee for many years. We also have Sir David Vaness. David had a distinguished career as senior police officer at Scotland Yard, uh, uh, dealing with neg negotiations. He negotiated the end of the uh, siege of the Iranian embassy in May 1980. Another trustee is Sir Kevin Tebbit, who is a former head of GCHQ. There's an excellent biography of Erin Eve written by Patrick Bishop, which was published in 2019. The title is The Man Who, who Was Saturday. Saturday was Erin's code name in MI9. I would urge you for further information on the trust to go to our website, www.erinevetrust.org.uk, where you will find a lot more information. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hugh. And it's really been a pleasure to work with you on the board um, throughout this last couple of years on these projects. I so really appreciate the support and encouragement. Um, it is now my great pleasure to turn over the screen to the four authors of the issue briefs that we are launching today. Each of these looks at a slightly different angle of the question that I put to you at the outset. What have we learned? What are the applications of sanctions? And so we will have one paper that looks at lessons learned from 1267 and the evolution of the terrorist threat, the application of sanctions with some consideration of whether this would work for, for violent far-right groups. Uh, we have an issue brief looking at the evolution of violent far-right groups and key trends within them and which of those trends may be amenable or not to sanctions. Um, we have a review of Five Eyes countries and the measures taken uh, throughout um, a number of them with a particular focus also on the US and, and some of the activities uh, targeting REMV actors. And then we have a specific study looking at Canada and some of the implications um, of measures taken by Canada. So it gives me great pleasure to turn over the screen to Colin Clark to speak to us about his issue brief. Go ahead, Colin. Thanks so much, Noreen. Uh, and I also like to thank uh, the Area Neve Trust for their generous support uh, and guidance throughout this process. Uh, so like Noreen mentioned, I decided to, uh, I think, start at the beginning for me, which is to take a step back and look at the evolution of the 1267 regime uh, and what impact it had against groups like Al Qaeda, like the Islamic State um, and their respective affiliates around the world. Uh, and then to ask the question, to what extent, you know, would, would some of these measures and tools be effective against far-right violent extremist groups um, as we know them? And uh, I think, you know, when we look back at the evolution of the so-called global war on terrorism, um, clearly in the Beltway in Washington, D.C., in Brussels and elsewhere, uh, the zeitgeist has has shifted, right? It's no no longer about the war on terrorism. It's about great power competition. Uh, in fact, you can't really have a conversation about geopolitics these days without talking about Russia and China, and for good reason. Uh, my main concern is that we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and kind of discard the lessons learned and best practices uh, 
over the previous two decades. And I think um, there's quite a bit that we can salvage. Uh, now, not all of it is gonna be applicable and it's not a one size fits all approach, uh, but there, there is a lot that we can learn um, from, from the past 20 years. And that's essentially what this effort uh, aimed to do. So I'm gonna discuss uh, at a very high level kind of our main findings, uh, and then I'll talk about some of the recommendations. Uh, now, for those interested in you know, the granular details, the examples, uh, and the, the robustness within the paper itself, I urge you to, to read the issue brief, um, and I'm happy to get into any of the details during Q&A. Uh, the first main finding is that because terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS have been successful uh, in adapting and innovating in response to counterterrorism measures, uh, it's crucial that we develop a flexible, responsive sanctions regime similar to the 1267 regime, uh, but that can include new organizations and bodies that are designed to keep it relevant uh, and applicable. And any new regime considered for violent far right groups should be similarly flexible, both in terms of the various measures employed, but also re with respect to the individuals and assets targeted. Uh, I still remember, you know, uh, General McChrystal talking about it takes a network to defeat a network, and I think we need to think about that in terms of uh, kind of adapting some of the more cumbersome bureaucratic aspects of counterterrorism to meet the current threat. The second major finding is that due to ISIS's relatively unique ability to capture and administer large swaths of territory uh, as it built its proto-state and diversified its funding portfolio, it, it's somewhat difficult to assess how effective sanctions were against this group uh, because they largely raised funds and spent them internally um, had such uh, kind of a vast treasure trove of resources for such a long time. And I don't think that there's um, a sense that anyone thinks there's going to be a far-right violent extremist alternative to what ISIS was able to create. Um, I think it's it's highly unlikely. Um, in, in the world of counterterrorism, I, I never want to say zero percent, uh, but it's very unlikely that we're going to see something similar. Um, if certain threats concern only a limited number of states, this is the, the third um, high-level finding. For example, the right-wing threats likely to be more prominent in North America, Europe, uh, Oceania, though it certainly exists elsewhere. There may be less of an impetus or little sense of urgency uh, for states outside of those immediately impacted areas to take action. In that sense, the threats posed by Al-Qaeda and ISIS were a bit more transnational in nature, and as a result, generated global consensus more easily. I also think 9-11 was a huge rallying point for the international community. Uh, we saw you know, cooperation at levels previously unseen uh, before and, and frankly since. Uh, fourth, one of the primary challenges to evaluating the impact of sanctions against terrorist groups is the lack of an assessment framework uh, in addition to data gaps. I mean, this is something that uh, myself and, and many of my colleagues uh, and, and researchers in this field have been banging the drum about for a while, but it really strikes you when you dig into the data and, and go through uh, research exercise like this. Uh, the sensitive nature of, the, of data related to terrorism and CT is one of the primary reasons why it's been difficult uh, to provide a comprehensive assessment of the UN's overall impact in this area. But the other reason is it's, it's hard. <laughs> Evaluation and assessment and measurement are difficult. Um, and as a result, we often kind of hand wave it and think about it only after the fact. Um, and, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the recommendations. The, the first recommendation is to focus on tailor-made regimes that can adapt to the terrorist threat uh, flowing from the first major finding. Uh, threat analysis to drive effective CT strategies isn't a direct comparison between AQ and ISIS on the one hand and far-right violent extremist groups on the other. Uh, there's going to be some similarities, but there's also going to be many differences. Uh, so those designing potential sanctions need to address the threat of violent far-right actors uh, and consider how these networks are structured, how they raise, move, store, obscure, manage, and use funds, uh, where they derive arms and ammunition, and how they seek to travel across borders to recruit new members and spread propaganda. Since many travel and logistical networks have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, it could take time to identify patterns and trends uh, being exploited by violent far-right actors in this space. I think we're, we're probably in that window now with uh, the pandemic ebbing in many areas where we're going to see travel, uh, we're going to see network, we're going to see attendance at events like MMA fights and white power music festivals on the far right where a lot of this bonding uh, and rapport building takes place. Uh, and it could be revelatory to conduct a comparative analysis of the group sanctioned 
under the 1267 sanctions regime and those violent far right actors that might be eligible based on their individual profiles. A second major recommendation is to establish metrics to assess the implementation and impact of sanctions regimes. Just because it's hard doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, any future sanctions regime is going to suffer similar challenges to that of 1267, unless it's able to devote resources and capabilities to devising appropriate metrics uh, and, and can do so uh, in a way that provides a comprehensive overview of the impact. I think it's critical to be explicit about a theory of change when designing sanctions, and the UN Security Council should ensure that assessments conceptualized in the earliest stages of any sanctions regime, uh, but also that the assessment is robustly resourced. Presenting metrics in a way tailored to specific stakeholders and ensuring that data collection and results are as transparent as possible will help gain multi-stakeholder buy-in from states. Uh, and since metrics often drive decision-making, the ways in which assessment results will be used by the decision makers must be a consideration throughout the process. Uh, for this recommendation to fulfill its potential, it's crucial that UN member states take it upon themselves to pay close attention to the collection and analysis of data. Uh, and then finally, to invest in international cooperation for implementation. Uh, similar to the difficulty in sustaining momentum for a sanctioned regime against Al Qaeda and ISIS, terrorist organizations, both with, with truly global reach. Uh, it's going to be challenging to maintain a sanctioned regime against violent far-right terrorists, particularly white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Uh, many countries may consider this a Western issue, with Five Eyes countries and other European nations facing the lion's share of the threat. Uh, but even if the political will in non-Western countries might be lacking uh, because of the lack of perceived threat, Five Eye countries and other allies should capitalize upon pre-existing information sharing and intelligence cooperation best practices. This is what I was referencing earlier with don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there's a lot of relationships that have been forged over the last 20 years uh, that can still be quite effective in this, uh, you know, with the current wave or current threat posed by the violent far right. Um, I think uh, disrupting violent far right net networks um, is going to be uh, similar, at least in terms of we're, we're, we're dealing with similar tools, right? So arms embargoes, travel bans, asset freezes, and a consolidated list that builds upon and improves some of the shortcomings facing the 1267 sanctions regime. Uh, this could include building groups of like-minded states. So think of Five Eyes and Friends or, or 14 Eyes or some of the different arrangements. Um, and if I uh, might be so modest to, to point out, we had an infographic this week on the history of the Five Eye relationship uh, that details some of the different configurations that um, we might think about in this regard. Uh, and then also championing mechanisms that can build a comprehensive sanctions regime that's less piecemeal and thus serves as a force multiplier. Um, so, so that's it for now. I, I guess my last kind of, um, you know, I guess corollary to that recommendation would be to begin preparing now, right? So whether you're the government, whether you are civil society, whether you're a financial institution, knowing the lay of the land, who these groups are, what their capabilities are, what their intentions are, is crucial before it becomes too late. And all of a sudden, um, you know, someone is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, there's some bad guy money that's flowing through. Um, weren't you aware of this? Didn't you, you know, are you just looking the other way? And we've seen this happen before. Um, to no fault of, of their own. We've seen banks and other institutions caught up, you know, whether it's the Islamic State, uh, Mexican drug cartels or others. So I think being aware in the earliest stages, trying to get um, ahead of this threat and getting out there um, uh, and learning about these groups is, is crucial. So thank you very much. Look forward to Q&A. Thanks, Colin. And thanks for highlighting it's not just a lack of data, it's a lack of the assessment framework itself. And I think that speaks to some of the challenges states have had in articulating what their objective is with the sanctions, right? What is it you want to achieve? Is it signaling? Is it political? Is it legal? And so I think that's a that's a really important call, not just to start collecting data, but before we do that to actually think about what your metrics and assessment frameworks are. But you talked about the evolving threat. And so it gives me great pleasure to turn the screen over to Molly, who will talk a bit about her key findings and uh, key trends in the movement. Molly, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I'm Molly Salzkog, research fellow with the Sufan Center and the author of the issue brief, uh, like Noreen mentioned, that examines four key trends in the violent far landscape. Uh, with a focus on how these have facilitated ideological, financial, 
and or operational aspects of the movement. And in this examination, I've, I've taken a view to, to understand whether or how sanctions, designations, listings, or and prescriptions could prove a useful tool in countering or at least constraining these trends that we are seeing now within the movement. And um, before I jump to the findings uh, and recommendations, I just want to men briefly mention these trends. I won't go into much details, but happy to do so in the Q&A session. I could talk about these trends for the remainder of this webinar, but we want to hear from everybody. So um, the first trend is a role of advanced technologies in violent far-right groups and specifically, and the movement writ large, specifically social media, the use of cryptocurrencies, end-to-end -end encryption, and 3D printing of firearms. The second trend is the recruitment of children and youth. And this was something that has been highlighted in the roundtables discussions that TSC has hosted and the expert interviews that we've conducted as part of this research project over and over again by multiple different states that this is a, 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 a concern, um, this trend of recruitment of children and youth within the movement. And the third trend is the transla transnationalization of the movement. And lastly, the fourth trend is the phenomena of ideological convergence of violent ideologies making up the contemporary violent far right movement. And for those not familiar with this terminology, it's where seemingly contradictory ideologies are utilized to justify and mobilize towards violence. And one example ex uh, examined in my issue brief is um, uh, eco fascism, for example. Um, and I think before jumping to um, the uh, findings, um, one thing that I want to highlight um, is that these trends throughout the research has become very clear that these trends frequently overlap and are on occasion mutually reinforcing. And this leads me to the first high level finding, which is, while there are, of course, um, groups that sport clear command and control structures, formalized membership and so forth within the violent far right um, landscape of today, the trends examined in this issue brief have aided in defining the contemporary violent far right movement as this diffuse, non-formalized yet transnational networks um, supported by online uh, connections. And what we saw is that these trends uh, facilitate that within this network, which is facilitated by the advancement of technologies. There's a plethora of violent ideologies that remain accessible uh, and from which users pick and choose to justify violence. And this is coupled with tactics, the easily found tactics to mobilize toward an act of violence with a global audience to celebrate this violence. And this has contributed to the prevalence of low complexity, low tech and copy paste attacks when we think about the violence specifically in the attacks. And now to the second um, high level finding that in the examination of, of these trends um, and evaluating whether sanctions, listing and prescriptions would be useful, we, uh, I did find that it would be uh, useful in countering some of these identified trends and primarily when it comes to financial and operational aspects within these trends. Uh, but also to some extent ideological aspects, if to a lesser degree, especially when it comes to the deterrence aspect of, of sanctions, designations and prescriptions. Um, but it's also important to note, and this was brought up numerous times through interviews, through the roundtables that we hosted, that the, uh, the application of sanctions listing and prescriptions against violent far right groups also carries a significant weight of signaling signaling to the international community, to allies, to partners, a country's willingness to combat a specific terrorism threat. And specifically here, uh, the issue was raised um, over and over again about the notable lack of the United States designation of violent far right groups as foreign terrorist organizations, or specially designated global terrorist entities with the exception of the Russian imperial movement. And this leads to the first recommendation, which is, and it marries the first key finding with the last key finding, but the recommendation is that the US should consider designating for foreign violent far right groups and individuals under either the US FTO or EO uh, uh, 13224 designation authorities. And yes, we recognize that the nature of the violent far right movement complicates the potential applicability of sanctions, especially in the US legal framework. It is important, however, to signal ideological agnosticism when dealing with political violence. 
And um, in this recommendation, we, I explore a couple of ideas how to go about this, uh, which I know my colleague Jason will also likely expand on. But first, to determine whether any non-US based individuals or group on the UK, Canadian, New Zealand, or Australian terrorist list can be sanctioned, sanctioned under these regimes. Another possible avenue for the US to explore is whether to examine the applicability of other existing sanction regimes to disrupt the network, the transnational network. And lastly, the US could also work diplomatically with other states, particularly Five Eye partners, to support listings in other countries to further circumscribe the operating space of far right terrorists in partner states and disrupt this network. However, it's also important to recognize um, the limitations of sanctions as a tool, uh, especially when considering the nature of the violent far right threat. So I also developed three other recommendations to aid in countering or constraining these trends examined in the issue brief. Um, the second one, uh, the second recommendation is for Five Eye countries to continue to innovate on other forms of regulations. This will be particularly important when it comes to the 3D printing of guns, anti-money laundering regulations for cryptocurrency and social media regulatory frameworks to complement sanctions where necessary. The third recommendation is to focus on strengthening international and multilateral cooperation among Five Eye countries encountering the threat from far right terrorism and build on that with relevant partners. This includes increased funding and resources to research the evolving a violent far right landscape, because as my issue brief uh, illustrates, it's rapidly involved, uh, evolving and um, violent far right extremist groups, organizations, and individuals are actually taking lessons learned from the past 20 years to innovate. Five Eye countries should also consider establishing an informal forum to share information, intelligence, trends, best practices, and connect frontline practitioners with one another, as well as international uh, partners like the United Nations and the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Lastly, um, it's important to strengthen international cooperation to counter the narratives of the violent far right movement and mainstreaming of violent far right narratives coupled with the ideological convergence as I highlighted as a trend really presents a challenge for how to prevent recruitment and radicalization within the movement. And it will be important for Five Eye countries to cooperate with other stakeholders, including the European Union, the United Nations, and so on to counter extremist narrative um, and learn well also learning from past experience of, about what works and what doesn't i'll stop there and happy to discuss anything further in the q a thank you thanks so much molly i really appreciate that and i think that um it, it's really important to think not only about the potential of sanctions but the limitations and so also a reminder that sanctions are but one instrument in the ct security toolkit and you know too often i think we have leaned very heavily on sanctions because it's concrete it's identifiable you can sell it to your citizens and publics as a concrete action but we forget about all the kind of diplomacy and hard work and other policy and legal instruments that really need to underpin those responses so thanks for the reminder um jason the screen is yours Thank you, Noreen. Great to um, be on this uh, Zoom session with the team. Um, thank you to the Ari Deev um, Trust for its support. Uh, the paper that I co-wrote with a graduate research assistant of mine who provided excellent research for me to, to put this issue brief together, focused on the array of terrorist designations deployed by Five Eye countries against what I often refer to in this paper, and it's a, a US term, um, racially, ethnically, motivated violent extremist actors. And the paper is informed by my own experience. I worked more than uh, 10 years in the Counterterrorism Bureau at the State Department, uh, sanctioning individuals and organizations. So I, I have a lot of direct experience on this issue, um, extensive desk research, uh, interviews, roundtables, and survey responses, um, chiefly from the US government. Now, aside from the introduction, the paper has four sections. The first paper, first, the paper examines the history of Five Eye terrorism listings very generally. Second, the paper compares and contrasts the Five Eye designations and prescriptions specifically deployed against REMV actors. Third, the paper seeks to measure the effectiveness of designations deployed against REMV entities. And fourth, the final section of the paper offers five recommendations. And throughout the paper, the paper seeks to answer many questions to include most importantly, what impacts have REMV listings have had, if any? For instance, have REMV designations resulted in asset freezes? 
prosecutions, or other immigration-related consequences. Other questions explored in the paper are the consequences of a prescription and designation carried out pursuant to legal authorities. What are they, very plainly? And we have an excellent table in the paper that outlines the legal authorities of these countries. And then finally, and this points to something Molly had mentioned, what are the normative and symbolic benefits of the designations of REM V actors? And if there are benefits, what do they look like? And how do they actually contribute practically to countering REMV threats? So these are some of the answers the paper seeks to answer. And once you've read the paper, and I hope you do, um, you'll understand there aren't straightforward answers to those questions. But my hope is that the paper will offer some ideas on how we can harness terrorist designations in more effective ways, while also hopefully preserving civil liberties and human rights. Now, the history of 5i terrorism listings essentially dates back to the aftermath of 9-11. But I want to be clear, designations regimes did exist prior to 9-11 in a few places. The United Kingdom, the United States were sanctioning actors as terrorists pre-9-11. But those designations I would describe as being very limited. 9-11 changed everything. We had the rapid expansion of the UN 1267 regime in the aftermath of 9-11. You had the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 1373, which encourages countries to designate terrorists um, and calls on countries to criminalize terrorism financing. You had George W. Bush sign Executive Order 13224, which would become the chief tool utilized by the state and treasury departments to designate both individuals and groups. All that happened after 9-11. And those tools were a large part of essentially focusing on at that time was the Salafi jihadist threat primarily posed by Al-Qaeda and then later on by ISIS and its affiliates, particularly during the time period of 2014, when you saw the Five Eye countries, the United States and the United Nations use those tools um, very uh, significantly to counter ISIS financing and to specifically counter foreign fighters. There are a few exceptions to that rule. There were designations of Palestinian rejectionist groups by a number of the Five Eye countries um, and Iranian proxy groups. But suffice it to say, Designations of REN-V actors wasn't a priority at that time period, really for the 15 years after 9-11. And I think that makes a lot of sense, as Colin said, because at that time, the pronounced threat to international uh, peace and stability was posed by ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And I do think there's a credible argument that that's still the transnational threat uh, remains largely animated throughout the world by ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But times are different. And as Molly, I think, had made clear in her briefing, and so many other studies have as well, such as the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Director at 2020 report, there is a rapid rise of the threat posed by the, the radical right. And I think that report and many others have made clear that the REMV threat is quite pronounced. So how are five I countries aligned against that threat vis-a-vis -vis designations? In my view, they're not aligned as well as they could be. There's a lot of room for growth. The first 5i designation of a REMV actor came out in 2016 when the United Kingdom prescribed a neo-Nazi group by the name of National Action. Now, the UK would go on and designate a handful of other far-right groups. But interestingly, Canada has been really the leader amongst 5i countries, and Jess is going to talk about this, I think, as well, in terms of how they've deployed terrorist designations against REMV entities and anti-government groups. Now, while New Zealand and Australia have sanctioned far-right groups, They've not been as prolific as the United Kingdom or Canada. And finally, as Molly intimated, the United States has only designated one REM V group, the Russian Imperial Movement, and that was a State Department designation from April 2020, um, pursuant to Executive Order 13224. And as Molly noted, the State Department has never labeled a REM V group as an FTO. So one of the key findings of the paper that I co-authored is that there is a lack of consonance between 5 I countries on how designations are deployed, and in my view, it's going to be very difficult to bridge that gap because of the unique challenges the United States faces that other Five I countries simply do not, namely surrounding the issues of the First Amendment. Now, the paper doesn't just look at groups. It also looks at individuals. The United States has designated six individuals as terrorists who can be characterized as REMV actors. Four designations carried out by the State Department pursuant to EO 13224, and two very recent designations by the Treasury Department pursuant to EO 13224. New Zealand has designated an individual, Brenton Tarrant, the infamous Christchurch mosque killer um, in 2019, and Canada has designated an individual by the name of James Mason 
who is a, a infamous neo-Nazi. So in total, you have 10 people that have been sanctioned um, who actually follow Rem V ideologies. Um, and not to sound flippant, but I would posit that there are more than 10 Rem V types of individuals who could potentially meet the legal criteria for designation. I see Noreen smiling, um, and I'm trying not to be flippant, but I, I, the facts are what they are. I think these tools can be actually deployed more. Now, the bulk of the paper actually explores the efficacy of these regimes, but I know I'm down to about one minute, so I want to essentially give you my bottom line up front is that this. Measuring the effectiveness of these regimes, especially against REMB actors, but even more broadly, was very difficult. And quite frankly, the data doesn't exist to have a comprehensive review of effectiveness. And this is one of the recommendations pointed to by Colin as well. Anecdotally, there are a lot of examples, and there are a lot of examples in the paper I point to where there has been successes, but that's not a comprehensive way for countries to measure effectiveness and sanctions, much less those deployed against REMV actors. So on recommendations, the most important one is to develop metrics. Um, that's the top one. And there are other recommendations I, I recommend, but based on my experience, um, metrics, especially knowing how much time goes into the crafting of a terrorist designation, at least from the US perspective. And I know how the Five Eye countries generally do this as well. Um, it takes a lot of bureaucratic and financial capital to carry out a, a sufficient designation. So how can you know how to devote resources unless you have really good metrics? The last thing I'll say is, um, as a gold standard, Treasury Department in the United States actually produces a report called the Terrorist Asset Report. And I talk about that fairly extensively in the paper, where it does actually examine assets frozen um, in the United States associated with designated terrorist groups. Uh, and I think that is something that other Five I countries should take a look at. So with that, Noreen, I want to hand over the floor back to you and look forward to the questions and answers. Thanks so much, Jason. And, you know, I agree, this is not really a, an issue for flippancy, but, you know, I, I would hazard a couple of Cortados that we are looking at upwards of 10 uh, REM V actors. So, you know, I'll, I'll take that bet. Um, but, you know, you pointed also, I think, to a really important aspect. It, we don't talk a lot about underutilization of sanctions, and that's something we can talk about more. Could they have been more effective if they'd been better and more often used? I know that's been a question we talk about sometimes um, in terms of uh, 1267. And thank you for flagging 1373. Uh, Jason and I, a little while ago, also wrote an article making the case that, you know, in the multilateral space and through the UN, maybe what we're not looking at is a 1267-like regime. Maybe we're looking at more creative views of 1373. And I, I know we have a number of colleagues from CTED who had registered for the event, but it's definitely something we can uh, follow up, but certainly for UN member states to think a little bit more about the language in 1373 and making use of that avenue uh, to think about countering RMV actors. Um, I'm going to turn over to Jess to give us a little bit more of a specific uh, outline of how things have played out in Canada. Before I do that, though, I just wanted to point out questions are coming in um, into the Q&A. I will challenge all our briefers to stick to like one minute responses because I'd like to flag as many of these questions as I can. So, um, you know, a little bit of CT speed dating at the end of this. So start firing up the questions and Jess, the screen is yours. Thanks, Noreen. And uh, hello to everyone. And it's so nice to see so many of you here to talk about this important topic. And of course, to see so many familiar names. And thank you, of course, to the Ari Neef Trust and the Sioux Fan Center for allowing me to be part of this project. It's been a real privilege um, to both advise on the project and, of course, to contribute my own analysis of lessons learned from Canada's experience listing violent far right extremist groups, or as we would call them here, ideologically motivated violent extremist groups. So as you've heard today, there have been a number of key themes that really permeate all of the individual issue, issue briefs. The lack of metrics to understand what our sanctions are achieving, the lack of a theory of change, as Colin mentioned, diffuse networks that might be somewhat resistant to the effects of sanction, as Molly talked about, and those low complexity, low cost attacks that might also have some resilience to the effects of sanctions. Um, and of course, the lack of US designations in this space. So there's plenty of reason for pessimism here. But I also think that there are a few notes of optimism that I want to highlight. I think that the overlap in the recommendations between the issue briefs is particularly promising. So we've looked at this issue from a number of different angles, and we've managed to find common ground and agree on a few key re recommendations that are all mutually reinforcing. 
from our part, my part, when we look at sanctions, prescriptions, or listings, I think that we need to do a few things. We definitely need those better metrics. And those metrics need to be localized to the jurisdiction where the prescription is happening. We all have subtly different regimes, as uh, the chart in, in Jason's brief really illustrates. So when we do our evaluation, we have to really understand those nuances and differences. I think we also need to look at the outcomes and object objectives of our listings along three key lines, which I discuss in my issue brief in terms of how they've been implement effect how they've how Canada has been implementing them and, and the effects of them. And the first one is the operational effects of sanctions, most of which are financial in, in I think most cases in the five eyes. And you know, this is really how the sanctions work to reduce the operational effectiveness of individual terrorists or terrorist groups. So we need to know a fair bit more about that. But there's also support effects. Some of the effects of the sanctions might not be quite as obvious as those operational effects. In some jurisdictions like Canada, they enable things like investigations and analysis. Listings aren't the only tool that do that, but it can be important for some of our security and intelligence agencies. So we really need to understand the support effects of listings, designations, sanctions, et cetera. And of course, the signaling effects. This has been very important in shifting the public conversation around threats and making the idea of violent far right extremist groups and movements in Canada more concrete. So I think we also need to keep in mind that listings and designations have that very important signaling effect for the public. As we go forward thinking about this issue, we also need to take into consideration the unintended consequences of the listings. I talk about the issue of de-risking by banks in my issue brief, but we also need to look at many other unintended consequences. You know, for instance, that listing a group can drive some or all of its members underground, force name changes, which of course has administrative uh, impacts on sanctions and listings processes, and all of which can also make some of our investigations more challenging. As with any counterterrorism policy, there are pros and cons. And I think on this particular issue, we need to do a better job of thinking them through when we apply this particular counterterrorism tool and also in conjunction with the other counterterrorism tools that Noreen was talking about. Ultimately, I do think that there are some, likely some important effects of sanctions on these types of groups and movements and coordinated effort amongst countries affected by this threat. And of course, by countries that are a source of this threat is critically important again. Um, is critically important. So to conclude, I think we have some evidence and arguments in these issue briefs supporting the policy of designating, prescribing, or listing violent far right extremist groups and movements. But we need to do a few things better. One of those things is transparency around what groups get listed and why, including that public justification. And J Jason was definitely talking about this too, in terms of like that prioritization process and what groups get listed in what order. There's, there's been some pushback around the listings of some of these groups. And so as a community, we really need to do a better job of sharing some of those legal justifications. I'll point to some countries that do this far better than others, um, particularly the listing packages produced by the public listings packages produced by New Zealand and Australia tend to be quite comprehensive. Um, but Canada is probably the worst in the five eyes for sharing information through the listings process. This is also important because it's information that can help other jurisdiction, jurisdictions designate these groups as well. And as we've discussed, coordinating that action is important for countering the transnational threat. Otherwise, we'll be in a position of these groups and movements playing jurisdictional arbitrage. So essentially taking advantage of the country with the weakest laws. I think we've already started to see a little bit of that with the Proud Boys and the designation in Canada and a lot of the activity shifting to or amplify, being amplified in the United States rather than in Canada. And then finally, I think it's critically important to expand this research and analysis outside of the Five Eyes. Our project was narrowly focused by design, but we all know that many other countries face these threats and have addressed them in different ways, including by making their own, making use of their own process for sanctioning groups. There are undoubtedly far more lessons to be learned and more best practices to identify from the efforts of many other countries. So with that, I'll turn it back to Noreen and I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. So we have about 10, 15 minutes left and I'm going to fire a number of questions at the group. 
um, and ask that you take about a minute to answer them. And you know, this is hopefully the start of a conversation um, with many of our participants today. Some of you have asked about the papers that we've all talked about. They are going to be uh, published and go live around noon. So watch this space. You will certainly be uh, hearing from us when they become available. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with questions. Like I said, if you could stick to about a minute, then we can get through more questions. I don't think we can get to all of them, in which case we certainly hope to, to follow up with many of our participants. Very quickly, Colin, you looked at the evolution of the UN sanctions regime in your paper. You've written earlier a lot on terrorist financing. What kind of developments should we worry about with far right groups? You know, you said we, we don't anticipate another ISIS in the violent far right movement, but you know, we also, many didn't anticipate ISIS either. Um, yeah. And so, what developments should worry us? I think there's a couple of things that are troubling to me in particular. Uh, the first is that uh, this is a highly decentralized movement, right? And so you're right, this isn't like ISIS. There's no center of gravity. As, as much of a challenge as it was uh, to deal with the Islamic State, we knew largely where they were, right? Physically, they were in Raqqa, they were in Mosul, uh, and it, it, it took a lot to destroy the physical caliphate. The far right violent threat is far more diffuse. Um, I think oftentimes we use the, the, the word lone wolf. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a misnomer pretty frequently. Uh, even if you look at the Buffalo attacker, I think there's this kind of broader far right ecosystem that's producing a lot of these people where they're radicalizing, where they're learning tactics, techniques, procedures, et cetera. Uh, that dovetails with something that Molly said, which is their uh, reliance on emerging technologies. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this in the 3D printed or additive manufacturing space. Uh, social media and to end encryption, virtual currencies, right? This is a, a movement that is uh, very fascinated by weaponry and talks a lot about it in their online manifestos. Uh, I think the young age of a lot of the perpetrators or alleged perpetrators, particularly uh, troubling to me, this is happening, especially in the UK, but, but elsewhere too, where some of the kids being arrested 15, 16, 17 years old, uh, to me, that signals that this is a generational struggle, right? This isn't something that uh, anyone's going to age out of quickly. Uh, and then lastly, and this, this is really hard to quantify, it's just more kind of the feeling you get when you study terrorism for a long time. Uh, the ideology seems trendy. It seems edgy. But at the same time, and, and maybe this is counterintuitive to being trendy and edgy, it's gone mainstream. Uh, and it's largely accepted and promoted on, you know, major uh, cable television news shows. And, and, you know, so it's this kind of fusion of internet subcultures with, you know, big megaphone coming together. And I think, you know, the Proud Boys are a clear byproduct of that uh, synthesis to me. Thanks, Colin. Um, Jason, you recently wrote another report uh, on far right financing and the radical right. Is there anything from that paper that you see also crossover into the paper that you've written for the Erin Youth Project? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Noreen. So the, the paper I, I drafted recently that was released on Monday looked specifically at uh, typologies related to uh, far-right financing. And I think there is some crossover um, from that paper to this. Uh, the, the one thing I would say is the, the challenge of fundraising um, pursuant to uh, the use of cryptocurrencies and uh, non-fungible tokens. Those are two aspects I talked about in this uh, other report. Um, as well as uh, crowdsourcing and other forms of uh, technological uses um, and technologies used to finance. Um, the interesting thing about where there's crossover is um, there was another report issued that I wasn't able to actually insert into this report I published recently because it, it came out during the publication process. And it was a report um, and developed by Caron um, that indicated that uh, the US designated uh, terrorist group, the Russian imperial movement actually was availing itself of non-fungible tokens to raise finance specifically um, through a project that the RIM created to, to fundraise um, to support uh, the Russian activities in, in Donbass and Ukraine. And I thought that was a really interesting development where you got a US designated group um, using essentially the open seas platform where non-fungible tokens um, are, are bought and sold. Essentially, NFTs can be anything that's artistic or otherwise. Um, and uh, the organization, as, as Karen depicted, um, was trying to uh, make money um, through non-fungible token sales. And I thought that was a really cross interesting crossover with this report, given that the Russian imperial movement is the only designated group the U.S. has gone after. It's actually the only group 
um, or the only country that has designated the Russian imperial movement also, which I find interesting too. So I thought that was a, a fascinating um, tangent. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jess, here's one for you, um, a question that had come in. While we see that some far-right groups have elected to self-dissolve and reform under new aliases, does ditching a well-known organizational brand pose substantial financial costs for groups who monetize the brand, possibly through the sale of merchandise? I would say that there's some disruptive effects of them having to change their names. Um, but I think that for the most part, you know, certainly from a counterterrorism perspective, a lot of our regimes are fairly quick or fairly adaptable in terms of adding the names or adding them to the listings process. From the group's perspective, um, I'm sure that there's some disruption when they have to get new merchandise, rebrand, create new logos, all of that kind of stuff. But there are from what I've seen of the the ecosystem, really, they're quite adaptive. And so I don't think that it's a huge disruptive effect on their financing activities. Okay, thank you. Um, Molly, this one, I'm going to direct it to you. Um, we have a question ca came in. Uh, to what extent do far-right groups have relationships or intertwined with political parties? Um, and, and to what extent are far-right groups getting support from nation states? And if so, is that support traceable or being given in a way that could render it vulnerable to sanctions? Um, I know we have a lot of thoughts on this across the panel. So how about I give 40 seconds to Molly, 40 seconds, maybe Jason, your bailiwick too. So Molly. Uh, yes, I'll be, I'll be quick on this one. So first on political parties, the, this research specifically didn't look at that since we were mostly uh, looking at violent, like the use of violence within this movement, right? Um, and, and whilst political parties can certainly, you know, um, silently promote violence or, or loudly promote violence, um, it, it was specifically those that commit acts of violence. Now on this nation state question, this is very interesting. And I think this is something where um, there's more research needed. And this is also where more intelligence gathering is probably needed. So not only open source research, but actual collection. But this is what one of the recommendations that I, I posed, um, being a bit more creative in how sanctions are applied because there are different sanctions regimes, uh, global and also available to the United States, for example. Like there are a lot of, um, there's a long been a conversation about the plausibility and likelihood of uh, Russian individuals close to the Kremlin having uh, financial or other operational ties to far right groups. And this was actually highlighted as a possibility in, in the recent report that came out of the UK on extreme right wing violence. Um, and looking at all of those, a lot of those individuals having been sanctioned either for their um, for human rights violations, for corruptions, uh, or for their involvement in, in the current ongoing conflict in Ukraine could potentially highlight these financial or operational ties if they exist. Uh, because feasibly, the intelligence collection should be there on these individuals because they were sanctioned. Jason, do you want to come in on that too? Sure. Yeah, uh, uh, that, I'm, I'm glad Molly handled it first because it's a very uh, sensitive uh, question. But uh, you know, in terms of sanctions regimes and how they can be utilized to go after countries that provide uh, passive or active support to um, designated terrorist groups, uh, it, it, I believe only the Canadians and the United States actually have a sanction tool to label um, countries as state sponsors of, of terrorism. The United States has used it very sparingly. Um, and the Canadians even less so over time. Um, so are there far right groups then is the question that um, could be uh, being sponsored by a state that could be sanctionable um, by say the United States or the Canadians. And I, I think Molly um, hinted at the possibility uh, of, of the Russians. And I think there is an example of the Russian imperial movement obviously um, has sanctuary in Russia. Sanctuary is one of the legal criteria that ends up um, putting countries on the state sponsor of terrorism list. Um, Iran's relationship with Hezbollah is one of the primary reasons why Iran, of course, remains on the State Department list. So that could be one mechanism states could utilize against uh, countries that are providing support to um, entities. And now, obviously, there have been calls for this by the Ukrainian government for the, the Russian Federation to, to be sanctioned because of uh, various things 
Um, but that relationship with the Russian imperial movement is the really interesting question, I think, that could put um, uh, the, the Russians at some kind of legal jeopardy with the United States using that tool. Thanks. Uh, Colin, do you consider 6 January 2021 as a, quote, 9-11 moment for violent far-right group designations in the U.S.? Is that the moment we should be looking at as a catalyst for more of this? You know, 9-11 is kind of a sacred event in our country. So to compare anything to 9-11, I, I just don't know if, um, if that works for me. But I get the essence of the question, which is, was, was it a watershed moment for the far right? And I think in many ways it, it, it was. Uh, while some people talk about it as a failed insurrection, for people that were part of that and promoted it, uh, they look at that as symbolically a victory, right? Uh, particularly if you, if you spend a lot of time online, like many of us do, uh, and, and witness what accelerationists are talking about, right? This whole kind of concept of bringing down the system. Uh, that was the closest, I think, that we've ever seen in this country. Um, and it, it, it did. It, it injected new lifeblood into the far right in many ways. I will say, I do think the response has been appropriate in the sense that, um, you know, federal law enforcement has gone after and arrested people and held people accountable that did commit crimes on that day. And it's not partisan, it's not political. If you broke the law, you are now being held responsible. And I think that was the missing component. We've long had a double standard in this country of, you know, if, if terrorism is committed by a brown person, it's immediately, you know, or violence, political violence, it's immediately terrorism. Well, if it's, you know, someone that looks like the people on January 6th, it's, well, you know, and we've already heard people on the right try to, you know, wash it away of saying like, well, these were just a bunch of tourists and uh, all these other things. Um, it, it was violent, people were, were killed uh, and it was truly an effort to overthrow the government. So I do think it was a watershed moment. And like we talked about in our report, our last report, um, uh, also sponsored by the Aaron Eve Trust, I, I think you know, the reverberations and the shockwaves have been felt globally. And you know, it's also uh, given groups overseas new ideas and how that they're going to follow some of their kind of accelerationist strategies. So um, I, I wouldn't quite say 9-11, I don't know if that's the appropriate comparison, but certainly a, a major uh, bellwether for, for what's to come. Okay, um, I'm going to take two and um, whoever wants to come in on these uh, before we close. Um, so one of the questions I'd like to put to the panel is, um, has anyone looked or considered the idea of designating like certain texts or symbols rather than groups in terms of addressing this threat? So, you know, some European countries, for example, criminalize Holocaust denial or, or the circulation of certain texts. Should we not be thinking of individuals or groups, but instead specific um, texts? Um, and then um, should we be looking at some more synchronicity between the Five Eyes countries in terms of sanctioning particular groups, or is this unrealistic given divergent national definitions of terrorism? Um, I would just add from my part, we are certainly encouraging synchronicity uh, with the papers, but um, those two questions on the panel, I already see Jess's hand up. So go ahead, Jess. Okay, I'll take the second one. I think that it's not unrealistic to think that there could be more synchronicity in terms of the listings. There's a number of informal mechanisms that exist or informal um, groups that and formal groups that exist that where these conversations could take place. So we could look at things like, you know, the Global Coalition Against Daesh as a potential frame framework or the Global Counterterrorism Forum, or even at a place like FATF, where it wouldn't necessarily be legally binding in terms of the recommendation to list a particular group, but there could be a coordination mechanism that could happen in those spaces. Um, and interestingly enough, it wouldn't necessarily have to involve the United States. You know, if the UN if the U.S. can't get over some of their internal hurdles quickly, the rest of the community could go forward without them. Um, you know, obviously less less than ideal, but it's a possibility. Anyone else want to? Any thoughts on the desk? Oh, Jason, go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I used my virtual hand. Maybe I just like done this. Um, so. Cool. Yeah, on, on, on the second question, I would just say, uh, you know, while I said in the briefing that I think there's always going to be a lack of consonance between the United States and the other Five Eye countries, uh, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a, a specific kind of group that they could actually work on together and, and, and team up and, and synchronize a, a rollout of a designation of a REMV actor. I think 
you know, depending on where that RIMV actor is based, it could be an organization that that's still not yet been created. I think we, we can't discount that possibility because the five eyes do share information with each other and it would be potentially possible. I, I think the first question is really fascinating on, on the possibility of designating terms and symbols um, and, and phrases. Um, you know, in, in the United Kingdom, one of the things I, I point to in the paper I wrote is that once a designated group um, is prescribed or group is prescribed by the United Kingdom, um, the imagery that could be associated, like a flag or something along those lines, could actually land somebody in jail. And I think um, that is actually one thing um, that we point to as a, a potential challenge, too, on the, on the other hand, right? Um, that, you know, where is that line on, on, on civil liberties? Um, but in terms of going after specific symbols using sanctioned authorities, I, I think the better outlet would be, and something that tech companies are already doing, is, is removing. And a lot of the tech companies I work with on a daily basis um, to actually remove certain symbols from their platforms. It, it's part of their policy. And I think that's perhaps the best avenue. Um, and I think it also speaks to another question that was in the Q&A regarding the role of tech companies. And I think that's the very important role that they can play is, is removing those symbols because those symbols, um, those manuscripts, those manifestos, they, they do radicalize other individuals. Thanks, Jason. We are coming to the end and we've had some tremendously wonderful um, questions come in, I'd like to encourage everyone who's been here and, and asked a question to actually follow up with us. You know, we'll make sure you, you see the papers, but we would encourage you to be in touch with us and we'd love to continue these conversations. Jason, you know, I'm really glad you mentioned about where is that line and, and civil liberties, because that's something we do address in a number of the issue briefs, that one of the lessons learned from certainly 1267 and other sanctions regimes is that there are um, unintended sometimes intended, but mostly unintended costs on civil liberties, on humanitarian action, on civic space, and particularly in the far right you know, ecosystem where we know a number of smaller NGOs have been really involved in prevention work, in exit work, in um, providing sort of rehabilitation efforts and, and working with groups like this. One key lesson learned that we do need to think about is any sanctions regime we develop, any measures, must not impede you know, this kind of civil society action, certainly humanitarian action when we see it, and make sure that there's a rule of law process, right? You know, Colin, you mentioned the Cadi case and how difficult it was to proceed with 1267 once we had Cadi. Well, we need to make sure not only that there's a perception of due process, but in fact, there is due process um, in these sanctions regimes and national listings. So I think that is also um, a pervasive theme um, in our briefs. Um, I'm really sorry to have to draw this conversation to a close. You know, if it was me and, and those of you on the list who know me know that I could go all day on this discussion and get far more in the weeds. Um, I know there was a question about other uh, UN bodies or under other multilateral bodies that could take forward a discussion on sanctions. Uh, there was a question on if or how CTED and uh, the Security Council could actually uh, take this conversation forward, as we mentioned in 1373. Uh, Jason and I had a few ideas on that in our article, but you know we would love to have these conversations with all of you. So I am now going to just uh, thank all our participants for your really active engagement this morning, for, for sharing your thoughts and reflections with us, um, to thank the Erin Eve Trust for supporting uh, all this work that has gone into it for in fact uh, over a year and a half really with both projects. Um, most of all, I'd like to thank the, the Sufan Center crew, our authors and the production crew who you know you don't see here, but Mo, Stephanie, Michaela, Joe, um, Amanda, you know, it, it takes really, a, if it takes a village to raise a family, it takes a crew like this to get a, a project together and so many things that bring it from idea to final draft. So really thank you to the authors today and to the Supan Center team and to the Ari Neve Trust. And please be in touch with us. We'd like to keep this going. Thank you. Thank you.